James Thomas is a bike fitter with over 20 years of experience. In today's episode, nine bikes that he hates. This is a bike that just really annoys the shit out of me. It's a bike that had every possibility of being like a real game changer. It could have been a really, really great bike. It's light, it's stiff, it's comfortable, it's compliant, it's easy to adjust. It's the specialized Athos. The bike has nice organic lines. It's got skinny seat stays for greater compliance. It's got a threaded bottom bracket, which means it isn't gonna creak. It isn't fully integrated, which means it's easy and it's cheap to service. And this was a bike that was touted by Specialized as a bike for the people. Why is it built like a race bike then? It's got a short head tube, a long top tube. The reach is way too long for any, almost all consumers. The stack is too low for almost all consumers, which means that most people riding it are gonna need a whole load of spaces underneath it and a really short stem in order to get it to fit, compromising the otherwise, what would have been a really great uh, riding bike and turning it into the heap. It's exactly the same geometry as the tarmac. Uh, so I don't really understand why it even exists. Uh, sorry, Specialized. You had the opportunity to make a great bike, but it's a thumbs down from me. Couldn't they just have made it shorter? Couldn't they just have, what they should have done is they should have taken Roubaix geometry. They should have made this bike with Roubaix geometry and it would have been like, it would have been amazing. Most road bikes and most of the road bikes on this list are not really fit for purpose. They're designed around a 20 year old 60 kilo athlete that can pedal at 350 watts all day long and puts out tens of hours a week on, on the bike. Translate that to a consumer. Most consumers that come in here are, aged, are men aged 35 to 60 and sit at a desk all day, carrying a few extra pounds, probably put out power of anywhere between 150 and 250 watts. There is a big, big difference there in terms of the human being uh, that is, the, the, in, in terms of the end user. Why can't the bike industry just make a bike that is light, stiff, comfortable, fun to ride, but also fits well? The Ribble Endurance SL. Now, actually, th this is a slightly muddy one because th there's nothing actually wrong with the bike itself per se. You know, it's a sort of aero road bike. The problem with it is the name. This is not an endurance bike. In no, on no planet in this solar system is this an endurance bike. For instance, if we can compare the stack and reach of an endurance SL to a corresponding size of a tarmac, it is six mil longer and three mil lower than a specialized tarmac which is a racing bike. So the problem with this is that anybody wanting an endurance bike is going to end up with a racing bike, so it's going to end up relatively uncomfortable. And anybody wanting a racing bike is never going to buy it because it's got the word endurance written on it. So just a bit of a silly name, really, more than anything else. Just be aware, it's a long, low, aggressive racing bike. <laughs> Live bikes. This is just a marketing exercise. This is something that Many women are led to believe that these are bikes that are designed specifically for women. I guess what we've got to think about is what are the the, the needs for women. And in, and in my opinion, my humble opinion from what we've learned in bike fitting is that women don't really need bikes to be pink. They don't need to be pandered to. They need bikes in a greater degree of smaller sizes more often than not. Historically, the school, the school of thought with women's bikes is that um, women have very short torsos and very long legs. And this is true for some women, but there are many women out there that also have relatively long backs and short legs. There are lots of men out there who have very short torsos and very long legs. I will admit, I'll be the first to admit, it's a particularly problematic shape in bike fitting because it predisposes a rider to being too stretched out. So historically, we've always been told that women's bikes are shorter. Women's bikes have steeper seat angles or slacker seat angles because of their longer femurs. The fact of the matter is that women don't need a women's specific product, they need more variety below, below a certain size range. Let's take the Envy Live in an extra small. So this is this is Ribble, sorry, this is Ribble's. This is Liv's kind of racing bike. It's the smallest bike they make, and it's got a reach figure of 370 mil. For context, that's the same size, that's about the same as a 52 centimeter tarmac. It's nothing remotely small about that. You will hear me uh, talk a lot about reach here because reach is a, a very important factor in, in uh, how a rider interacts with the saddle, how they interact with the front of the bike, uh, the amount of weight that they have on the front of the bike. Excessive reach is a very, very strong contributor to pain in cycling. And when you've got bikes that are excessively long, you either have a rider that is too stretched out, and as a result, they typically gravitate to the nose of the saddle or they fall into the front of the bike, 
or you end up having to compromise on the way that the bike rides by fitting very, very short stems, which mean that the bike feels very erratic and very scatty at high speed, uh, making it even worse for women who are typically less confident with things like descending, for instance, because they've been riding handlebars that are a yard too wide for them, which means they can't reach the brake levers, which results in less control. Speaking of handlebars, the concept of women's bikes is a great concept, and most manufacturers, they sort of kind of have the right idea, but they don't follow it through enough. So for instance, a medium-sized women's bike will have a 40 centimeter handlebar, which is narrower than what you would get on an average size men's bike, but it's still the same size width bar that I ride, and you ride, I think, and what most, in fact, I would say 90% of the men that leave here leave with a 40 centimeter handlebar. Whereas women vary a hell of a lot more in terms of their shoulder width. I've, I measure women anywhere between 38 centimeters right the way down to less than 32 centimeters. Obviously we've got a much greater spectrum of individual women, particularly when it comes to width with handlebars. So to that end, we've, we actually stock like 32 centimeter handlebars that we import from Taiwan. And none of this has been done with, with women specific bikes. There is no attention to detail to, uh, to just general uh, anatomy and morphology of, of, of how women are laid out. Um, and I think the only brand, again, I, 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 people are going to think that Pinarello sponsors this channel. Pinarello is a fantastic brand for smaller individuals because they carry a number of sizes below a, certain, a certain size range. With regards to Liv, it's basically a giant with a different lick of paint on it. What we did find, having looked at the geometry tables, is that an Envy Liv is about five millimeters shorter than a Propel, which is the equivalent giant. Uh, but five mil, it's not really enough. Uh, and, and again, you know, on, on what's supposed to be a racing bike, they've only got three different sizes, three sizes. And those sizes are slightly staggered against the men's in that the, the small is the same size, more or less, as a small men's. And they do, so realistically, they do one bike that's one size smaller than the men's in, in the live range. So I guess my point to this is that live is nowhere near as female focused as I feel it could be and should be. Uh, and I believe it's just a marketing strategy. I mean, I'm sure it rides fast and all, maybe not, but I, I hate this just because it's f ugly. And, and I know beauty's in the eye of the beholder and all this, but this is, this is my list, not yours. Um, it's like the, the evil love child of a Cervelo S5 at the front end and the giant propel at the back end. And it just like, it, it, well, no, why, why? Why would you put gold writing on a Celeste bike? Do we want to talk about the S5 as well? Yeah, also ugly. <laughs> also has a stupid proprietary front end that costs like a thousand pounds to change before labor. And you know, you gotta rebleed the brake system and it's like, you know, it's something that can't be adjusted in a bike fit scenario. And it absolutely categorically must have a fit before you buy it because you can guarantee that the cockpit's gonna be wrong. So bikes like this just, it's, it's bike fit is a nightmare. Any giant with the conduct mechanical to hydraulic braking system for the simple fact that it's complete dog shit. It basically took a mechanical, sh to be fair, this is quite an old system. You won't see it on any bikes now. Uh, it, it predates kind of Tiagra hydraulic levers uh, and maybe even 105 hydraulic levers, but it was basically a, me a means of using a mechanical shifter and converting it to a hydraulic brake. Uh, the simple fact is that it suffered really horrendously from, uh, from cable stretch and the system was just atrocious. Uh, yeah, crap. I just, I, I, I think that it, the Roubaix is, is just so unnecessary. It has this, you know, this suspension front end, which, and you know, the, there are other aftermarket brands that do this, but you know, there's a reason why like the Proflex and the Gervin forks that many viewers might not remember, um, that they stopped making them. Uh, having suspension at the front end, I just don't really see a great deal of point. The other thing with, that we found with the, uh, and actually this is the case with a lot of bikes that have integrated suspension systems in them, is that it adds a degree or another level of something having to be serviced. Because if you don't service it, it creaks. Like we had a bike in recently, it was a Roubaix with a, uh, with a future shock system on it. And there was like over a degree of movement of lateral play or rotational play in, in, the, uh, in the front of the bike 
because the, the cartridge hadn't been serviced in a long time. I question whether you're riding the right bike if you need that amount of suspension in the front of a bike. There's that stupid canyon grail, isn't it? It's got a handlebar that looks a little bit like that. And do you remember when we were in Vietnam and Lawrence had one, and every time he took his hands off the front of the bike, the whole thing just shake erratically. Like you need three rolls of bar tape to take the bloody thing, and like, wait, what's the, what's the point? It's just, it's just kooky for no reason whatsoever. It also looks like a Fokker triplane from the First World War. Yeah, genius piece of marketing from Canyon though, because we're actually talking about it. A number of generations of the Trek Madome. I actually own some of these, um, so I can speak very much firsthand about them and how shit they were. Firstly, the, I was probably 2000 and, probably 2008 or 2009, where Trek had the marvelous idea of putting the brake underneath the bike, under the bottom bracket, which meant that it got completely clogged up with shit. It seized and it failed to work ever again. Furthermore, the, the, the Bontrager brake that they actually fitted was shit. It's made of like, I think it was made of copper or something. It was so flexible. It had no power. And then you mated it with Bontrager's cork pads and Aeolus wheel. Guess what? You pull the brake and, and nothing would happen. I remember actually one right one time, like I think actually it was probably the first time I rode this bike home and I kind of had to do like a bit of an emergency stop because there was a van in front of me that braked suddenly. And I pulled the brakes and there's that kind of initial bite and then nothing happened. I just kept on going um, and nearly went in the back of a van. Uh, but ultimately, stupid place to put a brake. It's no longer a problem now because we have discs, but it was just idiotic placement of a, of a rear brake, all in the name of it being more aero. My other annoyance was of the previous generation Madone, not so much the, the new one because they've, they've changed the handlebar setup on the new Madone, but the previous generation had a, I need to get this right because I got it wrong in the last video. It's called a VRC shaped handlebar, which they say has got something along the lines of like 80 mil of reach. I don't know how they measure it because it's got over 110 mil reach, which meant that the, the cockpit was excessively long. So if you had a 100 millimeter stem and the VRC handlebar, because it was a one piece cockpit, it was kind of the equivalent to like a 120 millimeter stem and a normal handlebar. Um, ultimately, it just meant that when you fitted this cockpit onto what was already a really, really long bike, Guess what, it didn't fit anyone. And furthermore, when you had to inevitably change the cockpit, guess what, it cost 500 quid or whatever it was. Um, so ludicrously expensive, not particularly functional, and again, not fit for purpose. One of the more moronic things we've seen in here recently was like, so I, I have a lot of love for Or Orbea. They, they, you know, they, they make bikes in the Basque country, they make their own bikes, they make, apart from the bike we're about to talk about, relatively pretty bikes in my opinion. Uh, but we had an, an, an Orca Aero come through recently and Orbea have sort of slightly contradicted themselves in, in the design of the front end of this bike because the, the handlebar has uh, a little bit like a canyon uh, recesses underneath the handlebar for the brake lines to run through. And it was great in the sense that you've got little grub screws that would take off the said plate so that it would mean you could change the handlebar uh, relatively quickly and relatively easily. However, they undid all of this convenience building by adding a plastic fairing at the, at the, at the stem uh, placement, sorry, at, at the stem junction, which meant that you had to completely re-bleed re -bleed the brakes anyway. Just one of the more annoying and idiotic things that we've seen fitted to a bike. So we got, we got really excited about, oh, you know, we can, here's, finally here's an aero bike that we can change the cockpit out without having to put it into the workshop and re-bleed the brakes and go through all that rigmarole. But no, some stupid like, afterthought to try and make it look more slippery resulted in a need to completely re the brakes. So what was the point? There are nine bikes that James hates. Did we miss anything? What's your least favorite bike? Put it in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching and subscribe to this channel for more videos like this.